Hello, today I'm going to be discussing post-colonialism, the Caribbean, and Jean Rye's wide Sargasso Sea. So <clears throat> in order for us to, and this is a buildup to a discussion on wide Sargasso Sea, we have to understand a little bit about post-colonialism, both in terms of post-colonial theory and how it might apply to literature. Postcolonialism is a body of thought primarily concerned with, and what I'm going to go through here is a variety of slides that uh, describe and outline various tenets of postcolonial theory. So this is a body of thought primarily concerned with accounting for the political, aesthetic, economic, historical, and social impact of primarily European colonial rule. What is colonial rule? Colonial rule is uh, one country, one power, moving into another country, supplanting various aspects and various institutions of culture, and um, uh, installing their own cultural ideologies, cultural philosophies, cultural institutions. And we're going to be talking today about the Caribbean. <clears throat> Here I've already mentioned uh, European colonial rule, uh, but this is uh, something that has taken place uh, throughout history, uh, one country uh, imperially coming in and taking over another country and uh, imprinting over the native country, uh, cultural institutions, uh, and history. We're going to be talking primarily about the 18th through the 20th century. And we're also going to talk about what it means to be post-colonial here in just a moment. The world we inhabit is impossible to know <clears throat> without acknowledging colonialism or colonial history. And as we see in this presentation, uh, in the Caribbean and in places around the world, uh, there is uh, a combination, uh, a change of trajectory, an imprinting, a uh, hegemony of European colonial rule over uh, other native countries. <clears throat> what is post and post-colonialism or neo-colonialism? Post means it comes after, but we have to think about this term both in terms of, uh, well, in, in many different ways, in terms of politics and economics, um, in terms of geography. Uh, it doesn't mean that once an imperial power has left a colony, let's say, that the colony returns to a place that existed in time before the colonial power uh, came and imprinted itself over that native culture. So perhaps in terms of geography, that colonial power may have left but in terms of thinking about that culture and the ways with which that culture has been changed, that is part of uh, post-colonialism and that hasn't uh, left and the native country hasn't returned to a pre-colonial society. Caribbean islands that gain independence in the 20th century, and the point here that I want to make is that, that you will notice <coughs> that all of these countries gained uh, their independence in the 20th century, that this is not something that we're talking about that took place in the 19th or 18th or 17th century. That for many of these island nations, thinking about themselves as an independent people is a fairly recent phenomenon. And here, this is just uh, the, the Caribbean islands. <clears throat> so this is a process that began in the Caribbean with European contact with Christopher Columbus in 1492. And just to sort of recap some major facts that I've covered in some earlier presentations, that within 100 years of first European contact, nearly 90% of all native peoples in the Americas are dead uh, through war and genocide, but primarily through disease. And this is important because then this made it in many ways easier for European powers to imprint their culture on these colonized peoples, and that then facilitated the Middle Passage and the uh, importation of slaves from Africa, which then populated the Caribbean in order to work on the sugar plantations. So post-colonialism is concerned with forms of political and aesthetic representation. It has been committed uh, to accounting for globalization and global modernity. Yes, when you have one culture uh, collide or one culture introduced or interact with another culture, both of those cultures are changed. But what happens to the colonial 
to the to the colonized culture what happens to the uh, native country that doesn't have the the sort of political and economic power in post-colonial theory economics goes hand in hand with cultural institutions and cultural change Postcolonial theory has been invested in reimagining politics and ethics from underneath imperial power. So there's um, a hierarchy of power. And we're going to see in just a moment that there's really a kind of dichotomy, uh, binomial dichotomy in, in terms of the way that we look at Western and Eastern powers. It has been interested in perpetually discovering and theorizing new forms of human injustice from environmentalism to human rights. And oftentimes we think about the dichotomy with the colonizer and the colonized, two terms that I'm using specifically from uh, Albert Memnes, uh, the colonizer and the colonized, in terms of indigenous versus the imperial powers. Various, so what, what are we talking about here? We're talking about the various collisions of culture. And just because that one culture, and maybe it's a British culture we're talking about primarily here, goes into India or the Caribbean or the French move into Africa, and their desire is to uh, supplant that native culture, the colonial culture also changes. Language, technology, sovereignty, and law Post-colonial theory is interested in how these things change. Language, I think, is uh, one in particular because the ways with which colonized powers often then tell their story, which is what, uh, in many ways, post-colonial theory is about, the recovery of lost voices, those voices often have to express themselves not in their native language, but in the language of the colonizing power. We will be concerned and discuss the construction or destruction and reconstruction of identities in three terms that often come up in post-colonial theory uh, pertaining to identity, that it is doubled, hybrid, or unstable. In terms of the doubling of identity, and uh, I think this term might come from W.E. D. Duas, uh, B. Duas, uh, Dubois, excuse me, um, the souls of black folk when he talks about the double consciousness of identity that African Americans experience within American culture from African roots. But I think that this term applies also to the colonized, that in terms of identity, do they identify with their original native culture, which may have been one or two or more generations behind them, and they may not even be familiar with that, or their new identity, the identity that uh, is imparted to them, uh, placed over their native identities from the colonial powers. So we're talking about hybrid identities or hybridity to express the, uh, the sort of multivalent, the multifaceted complexity of identity in colonial and colonized, in, in the colonial and colonized dynamic. And so what can happen, and we're going to see this in Jean Rye's Wide Sargasso Sea, we often have an identity that is unstable, one where here a protagonist or an individual, a subject, is uncertain about their identity, that it shifts maybe depending on context. There is an alteration of historical trajectories. So a native country, a native people may be on one particular uh, trajectory in history, uh, development, culture, technology, and the colonial or imperial power comes in and that historical or that trajectory changes significantly. We need to think about assimilation, coercion, oppression, or a combination of these things. It is rare, if, um, if it happens at all, that a colonized power that a colonized people that a native people just says, okay, come on in here and take over and imprint your culture and ideology on us. So there's uh, coercion, and my point at the bottom is that there's often violence and trauma that are associated with this as well. The ways with which the sort of um, bi uh, bipolar, if you will, uh, uh, hierarchy, the East versus West, 
uh, in a very um, in a very simplified, oversimplified way that often Westerners think about the differences between Western powers and the East, terms such as the Occidental, the West, versus the Orient or Orientalism. What do these terms then represent? Um, in these very sort of neat, overgeneralized terms, they are code for that the West is uh, re uh, represented as ordered, civilized, cultured, and normal. As opposed to this, and this is part of the ideology, the justification for what Western powers, uh, the colonizer, has done, the East is represented by the West. So here the East does not represent itself. The West represents the East as having base human desires, that they are chaotic, confused, illogical, mysterious, and civilized, or excuse me, uncivilized. The um, image that I have over my right shoulder here, Orientalism, uh, by Edward Said, uh, in the late 1970s, this was one of the early texts that scholars point to that discussed the differences between East and West and was really uh, one of the seminal texts that many scholars suggest uh, of post-colonial theory. So some questions perhaps for us to consider. When does assimilation become diversity? And can it become diversity? The terms of hybridity versus integration. Um, you know, is a society, can a society become a melting pot or does it become fractured and stay fractured? And what moments in time, what moments in history would posit that a diverse society becomes fractured or a diverse society blends itself together in a kind of hybridity. Can one return to a pre-colonized period of tribal, communal, regional, or national and cultural history? So is it the fantasy of colonized peoples to return to a pre-colonized state? It might be a fantasy, but is it a possibility? And I think for the most part, the answer is no. Both cultures engaging in this, uh, the struggle for dominance, primarily the imperialistic and, and colonizing power in printing culture over a native country. Both of those countries have been changed. The native country, however, cannot return to a pre-colonized state. So what does that mean? What are the effects of and on the colonizer and the colonized? When does the colonizer become a native, a primary citizen? And at the end of colonial rule, how does the former colonialist fit in with society? Now, that question is posed from the colonialist perspective, which we'd say, well, the colonialists, why are we concerned with the colonialists and how they might fit into a country that is not theirs? And I think that is a very appropriate question um, and, and something uh, very important for us to consider. I ask that question because I think it's important for us to pose it in order to understand uh, the position that Antoinette has in Why It's Sargasso Sea. So in literature, some of the uh, themes that we might come across, uh, and these are in part, uh, uh, I think that we can see the relationship between uh, post-colonial theory as a theory and how some of those uh, how some of the theory enters into the literature. So topics that we might come across in the literature, independence, themes of immigration, national identity and allegiance, childhood, resistance primarily to colonial powers, language, how to communicate experience in the language that is no longer native, and a revision of history to include the colonized or other voices. Um, this is a couple of quotes here from uh, post-colonial theorists, one from Hami Baba. Post-colonial critique emerges, quote, from the colonial testimony of third world countries and the discourses of minorities within the geopolitical divisions of East and West, North and South. They intervene in those ideological discourses of modernity that attempt to give a hegemonic normality to the uneven development and the differential, often disadvantaged, history of nations, 
race, communities, peoples. And from a text that I um, uh, mentioned earlier from Albert Memney, quote, the colonialist does not plan his future in terms of the colony, for he is there only temporarily and invests only what will bear fruit in his time. The true reason, the principal reason for most efficiencies is that the colonialist never planned to transform the colony into the image of his household, nor to remake the colonized in his own image. Memney also discusses the kind of, um, the quality of person that the native or mother country sends to its colonies. And oftentimes, according to Memney, that the colonialist is not the best of what the native, uh, excuse me, what the mother country has to offer. Europe, if we take Europe as an example, they have a kind of class system where titles represented where, might, uh, where one might uh, exist and live in society. Not a lot of upward movement, always the possibility, I think, of downward movement. But for the colonialist, you could become something more than you were. And take Christopher Columbus as an example. Christopher Columbus came from um, a, a background that, that, that did not entitle him to lands and titles and all sorts of other things. He became the ultimate colonialist, bringing European culture and beginning a process that um, uh, took place in the first 50 years, first 100 years that we're uh, obviously living in today. But because of Christopher Columbus's success, he became something more than he would have been back in Europe, back in Spain, or back in Italy. So Jean Rise. <clears throat> Um, some, background, uh, some background about Jean Rise. I think it's important for us to have uh, some information about her. Um, it helps us understand the text a little bit, although I think reading the text and understanding more about the historical period might be a little bit more fruitful. But there's been a lot of uh, thinking and writing about Jean Rise, uh, particularly because of the various uh, spheres of discourse that Jean Rise sort of operates in. She was born 1890 and died in 1979. She grew up on the island of Dominica, and perhaps some of you have visited uh, Dominica in the Caribbean. Uh, lots of islands to visit uh, in the Caribbean, very beautiful islands. Um, but it's important for us to understand its very important colonial history. Jean Rise, as you can see from the image here, was a white woman uh, from a British society. She was born uh, on Dominica, and uh, she lived there until about the age of 16. She was alienated by her background. She lived most of her life in Europe, most of her life in Britain, but she didn't feel that she really belonged there. And uh, some scholars have pointed out uh, that she was both a West Indian writer, a European modernist, and a female writer. And part of the problem that Jean Rise had in terms of her identity, in terms of her being a professional, in terms of her being a writer, was that when she occupied one particular space, she felt alienated or was alienated because she occupied these other uh, spheres of discourse as well. So Why Did Sargasso Sea published in 1966. This was her most uh, popular novel. And I think it's difficult in many ways for us to place. Uh, I'm reading Jean Rye's novel here as a post-colonial text. Uh, there's a very strong argument that this novel is a modernist text. We see most, most of the action comes through the perspective of the characters, and so it's prejudicial. These uh, perceptions are biased. Uh, there's uh, one of the important themes of this text is the fracturing of identity, both important in post-colonial theory, post-colonial uh, post -colonial literature, as well as modernist literature. So this could be read as a late modernist text or a post-colonial text. And to, to lend uh, evidence to the, the sort of thinking that this is a modernist text, that in the 1920s, uh, perhaps one of the most uh, fruitful periods, uh, the fruitful decades, of literary production 
um, you know, you have a lot of writers working uh, and publishing in the 1920s. Uh, painters, philosophers, Gertrude Stein, Ernest Hemingway, um, Jean Ries is, is um, uh, with one of the expatriates, Ford Maddox Ford, becomes uh, uh, his mistress. Uh, so the 1920s is a particularly uh, productive period of literary history. And so this is where Jean Ries is, is sort of uh, understanding literature. So this is the tradition that she is coming from. So she's outside of the main current. So when she's occupying one particular space, she as a writer feels alienated because she also occupies these other spaces as well. She could be considered a third world writer and a woman in exile. She writes in her autobiography, Good Morning Midnight, I have no pride, no name, no face, no country. I don't belong anywhere. And I think that this quote from her autobiography, uh, if I did not tell you it came from her autobiography, we could see this spoken by uh, Antoinette or one of the other characters in Wide Sargasso Sea. Now, I also want to bring up absence versus loss. Now, this is, uh, these are definitions that uh, are often used uh, and discussed in trauma theory, and I think it's important for us to uh, consider them here as well. What, what is loss? Loss is something that you have had, whatever that might be, a uh, positive experience, a foundation in growing up, something, uh, uh, parents or whatnot, um, that is now gone. And so now there's a period of grieving, there might be a traumatic reaction to the loss of what that thing or what that person uh, was that is no longer there. Absence is something different. Uh, both, I think, in terms of Jean Rye's uh, and post-colonial theory and in psychoanalytic theory and trauma studies. Absence is something different. There is a kind of um, vacuum that is created for something that is supposed to be there, but not that that thing that was there is, was there and now lost, but that thing is now, uh, that thing was not there in the first place. What is its relationship to development of identity? Okay, so uh, some terms for us to consider. So, Jean Rhys grew up on Dominica, a very beautiful island uh, in the Eastern Caribbean. And so, you know, we go to these places, uh, at least in the old days. Some of us might have had the opportunity to, uh, to visit uh, Dominica and some Caribbean islands. Uh, I highly, highly suggest when you go visit these places, if you have the opportunity in the future when we can fly again, um, to consider its history. Uh, the islands in the Caribbean have a very, very complicated history and uh, are very complicated societies today. And many of the islands, and I think Dominica is, is no different than many of the other islands, there is a great discrepancy uh, between the wealthy and uh, the poor, and most of the uh, population of these islands live with a considerable amount uh, of poverty. To make things infinitely worse, these island, or, uh, Dominica was devastated by a series of hurricanes both in 2015 and in 2017. Part of the history of Dominica is that it was owned by the French from the 1690s to the middle of the 18th century, and then the British took over from 1763 to 1978. Dominica produced timber, coffee, but like many of the Caribbean islands, their main staple was sugarcane. And because of the sugarcane industry, both in Dominica and in the Caribbean in general, this facilitated the, uh, by some estimates, 15 to 20 million slaves brought over from Africa in order to work the plantations. <clears throat> so, just um, uh, for us to consider, I mean, you might have looked at the title, The Wide Sargasso Sea, and this is something that you've never heard before. Interestingly enough, in a 2018, uh, I'm not sure, I don't recall exactly what month, but in 2018, National Geographic did a really nice article on the Sargasso Sea. So, the Sargasso Sea is a region of the North Atlantic Ocean bounded by four currents. 
the Gulf Stream in the west, the North Atlantic Stream, the Canary in the east, and the North Atlantic Equatorial. And you can see in the map, you can see on the map over my left hand shoulder, uh, North and South America and Africa and Europe, that the Sargasso Sea, and uh, you can see the rotating currents in the Atlantic. Uh, this is a place that exists that uh, scholars refer to, that scientists refer to. Uh, Jean Rise was, was certainly not uh, the first person. And what is interesting about the Sargasso Sea, I think for us to consider, is that in <clears throat> this is the location uh, of the Caribbean. The Caribbean is located <clears throat> in the currents of the Sargasso Sea, that in her text, there's um, uh, death exists in a lot of different ways. Uh, the, the struggle and death of identity, the real death of various characters. The Sargasso Sea itself is really uh, a kind of oasis, if you will. Uh, it's an enigma um, of life. There are no land boundaries here. It's characterized by brown sargassum seaweed and um, often in calm blue water. There is an incredible diversity of marine life. Um, and uh, in this article in National Geographic, and you can find this uh, more information about this, that animals have adapted specifically to exist in sargassum weed in terms of their color, in terms of their ability to, some animals can, can exist on top of the seaweed, other animals exist just below, that there are various fish and other aquatic life, turtles that just exist uh, in the sargassum weed. Uh, and uh, again, this is really about life. And this stands, I think, in many ways in contrast to some of the things that are taking place in Jean Rye's novel. The Sargasso Sea also houses the North Atlantic garbage patch. And so we can see here, uh, I think, the uh, collision, if you will, uh, between human interaction and the natural environment. Okay, well this just gives us a kind of background on post-colonial theory, on post-colonial literature, and a very brief introduction to Jean Rye's and uh, hopefully some context that you can begin reading Wide Sargasso Sea. Thank you.